And I think that's unfortunate because it's truly an international organization. In the ranks are people of all backgrounds. It would be good if the leadership were also a little more diverse. Of course, one way perhaps of dealing with this mindset is uh, much more capable uh, civil servants in one's own country. Now, India, I think, still has an extraordinarily distinguished civil service. It's foreign service. Have you been complaining so about the slowness of our bureaucracy? <laughs> um, well, as I said, to start with, it's better than ours, <laughs> even though uh, it does have uh, problems. And sometimes one might wonder whether that slowness is also part of their feeling that perhaps a message should be sent that things have to move forward. But I'm sure we'll be able to remedy that. Um, I was just wondering about uh, not only for Sri Lanka, but also for SARC in general. Is there a case, perhaps, for moving forward training of our bureaucrats, maybe even of our politicians, in international affairs? I know that the SARC university is about to get off the ground, right. but it hasn't moved as fast, perhaps, as we would like. And is there a case, perhaps, for more joint programs of training, of getting our bureaucrats to work together, both to coordinate with each other, but also to present, let's say, a professional approach that would rival the professionalism of organizations like the UN. No, I would agree with that, though in fact the UN is an odd panel because the UN doesn't have a very effective training mechanism itself. It really takes people who have already been trained in their national systems yeah. or whatever their previous professional lives were, and it uses them. My own instinct would be that, yes, we could do a lot more in training because developing human capital is one of the prime neglected tasks of development. And India has historically been pretty good at this. In other words, uh, it's always been striking to me that one of the things we offer, for example, in Africa, that is most eagerly lapped up, is slots uh, of, for training courses in India. These are often mid-career courses, two-month, three-month courses in very specialized areas. But African officials love this. They come, they benefit from it. And an equivalent program for SAR countries, um, South Asian countries, may be a very good one. India will be wary of seeming to appear to be uh, lecturing to others or of telling others we're better than you so we can offer you something you don't have. So we need to devise a mechanism where there is more mutual uh, exchange and training. There must be things in which you know, experienced Sri Lankan instructors can train Indians well and there are things that Indians can train Sri Lankans or Bangladeshis or Maldivians in and we ought to be able to work out something along those lines. The idea is a good one, uh, Raji, but let us not only confine it to ourselves. Yes. Let us seek training where we can get it and in mm. some areas we should not be ashamed of getting training in the West, just as I hope that there are things that the West can learn from us. Yeah, I mean, one of our problems in Sri Lanka is that for training in the West, you need a certain language facility. And as I said, we haven't done well enough in English. But in South Asia, how can an Indian train a Maldivian without English? It's going to have to exactly. be English anyway. Exactly. So I think we will have to accept that that particular linguistic challenge mm. exists even within South Asia, not just uh, if we were to go to right. the West. No, I, I agree absolutely, and that's why I think the fact that India has made English one of its national languages and therefore continues with No, it's it. not one of our national languages, it's an official language. Yes. But, What's you know, de facto, two yeah. things have happened to English. The first is it survived mm -hmm. as a link language. In other words, when two Indians who may not have an Indian language in common meet, they will by default switch into English. Uh, but the second thing that has happened is that with the advent of globalization and the interlinking of the Indian economy, with um, outsourcing and call centers and business right. processing opportunities in the West, people have seen English as actually an instrument for economic advancement. And the result of that has been that all sorts of people from the sections of society that traditionally were opposed to English and where politicians used to think they could get votes by decrying English education, such people are putting together their hard-earned savings and sending their children to English medium schools, often not very good ones, mm. rather than government schools where they'll be taught in their mother tongue. Because they rightly feel their mother tongue they can learn at home, right. but English will get them a better job and a better future in an increasingly globalized world. So it is the market that has voted with its feet. It's not been government policy. I think the government is actually paying, playing catch-up. I think if the government had uh, been far more committed mm to enhancing and multiplying English language education throughout the country, the entire country would be better off. India has thrived in English despite the government, not because of the government. Of course, one thing as we are now learning is because India has always considered English your language as well. It's not <laughs> pre you know, received pronunciation. Well, I often point out that our great first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, wrote the discovery of India in English. So I would say he discovered India in English. Well, Why can't of course. we? 
Um, could I just check you about that distinction you made? English is an official language, but a national language. So you have just one national language. Well, actually, we don't have an official national language either. It's, right. The whole thing is quite amusing. Yes. Hindi is called our national language, yeah. but there is no legislation and certainly no place in the Constitution where that term is used. Right. It is merely a term of popular discourse that Hindi right. is our national language. And it's a term which obviously is resented in places like Tamil Nadu, where mm. they feel, well, who made it our national language and why should we? What has happened again is the market has come into play. Right. The success of Bollywood yes. cinema has actually done more to export Hindi to places in the South than any official policy or any notion of national language or any legislation could have done. Because these movies are so popular that people are essentially ending up imbibing a certain amount of Hindi from watching them that no amount of very incompetent instruction in the classroom mm -hmm. has been able to impart to them. And I'm always amused when I see the same thing happening abroad. Yesterday, in fact, uh, under your roof, I met a, a Sri Lankan gentleman who said that, um, that when we were discussing the merits of Sinhala and Tamil, that he said that in his family, his children watched so many Bollywood movies that Hindi was becoming their, <laughs> their language. No, I, I, I think Bollywood has really had a tremendous effect. Yeah. In, in, in that regard. Uh, but the way it works, therefore, is that in the Constitution, you have 15 official languages. 23. 20 now, right. 23. But that means instruction in any of them no, is permitted. Th in these schools. are languages which are recognized by the Constitution, and therefore they have a place. Uh, they can be used, for right. example, in Parliament, though you would have to notify in of advance course. a translation can be provided. Um, you will find their scripts in the rupee notes and the currency, right. all of that. But the official languages of the government of India are only English and Hindi. Right. And that's what makes English an official language. Because that's right. a practical matter. Of course. If you write a letter in Hindi to the chief minister of Tamil Nadu, it is extremely unlikely you will get a reply or that he would understand your letter. Mm. So you would write to him in English. That makes English an official language. Right. Similarly, if somebody from Kerala wants to argue a court case in Delhi, if he were not free to do so in English, he would not be able to make his argument known and understood. Right. So English as an official language is also a way of ensuring process fairness. Right. Fairness in the judiciary, fairness in governmental process, fairness in, in all sorts of ways of national life. In addition to that, of course, English remains the de facto language that transcends geographical and linguistic boundaries. Uh, to this day, the political agenda of the governing classes is set by the English language newspapers more right. than by any of the others. Now, the Hindi language newspapers have begun to outstrip the English language newspapers in circulation mm. because as literacy has increased, naturally the fact that at least 50% of the Indian people read and write Hindi, right. whereas uh, arguably fewer than 10% read and write English, means that the numbers are on the side of Hindi. And yet you will find uh, uh, more likely that uh, a storm is kicked up in Parliament over something said in the Times of India or in uh, you know, Outlook magazine, uh, rather than something coming out of the Denik Bhaskar or the, the right. Navbharat Times. Now, this is something which is a curious phenomenon. Perhaps it'll change. Mm. But it's, it's, it's a, it shows the persistence of a certain role for English in the, in the national debate and in the national consciousness. Uh, that again is not because of any conscious policy, but simply the way in which our society has continued to evolve in the 63 uh, years since the British left. One of the factors that, of course, that has promoted this is uh, what to me is the leaps and bounds with which Indian education has improved. You know, I still think we would like to consider that our provision of education is more comprehensive than Indians. I think we had extremely good literacy rates. And I believe we have every right to be very proud of our basic education. But I think one of our problems is that because that was so good, we have forgotten the cutting edge. And to me, institutes of excellence that India has produced have really been a fantastic example we should follow. Um, you know, talking about Indian institutes of technology, an mm -hmm. um, uh, institute like the J JNU University, which are world class, it seems to me. Um, how has this worked? I mean, how have you managed to develop such superb top quality institutions, research institutions as well, even in a context where you're still struggling very hard to get Basic literacy and yeah. female literacy in particular, on which you've done... Not well enough. You've improved considerably, but yeah, you can do better. No, I've often pointed to Sri Lanka as an example of a country which got the literacy challenge right. I think um, uh, by the early 70s, you already had literacy in your 90 percent, I mean 93 percent I think was a figure I remember when I was a college student in India looking at our dismal figures still below 50 percent and looking at Sri Lanka and thinking 
we came from the same legacy, mm. we are similar people, how did you manage to do something we didn't? And the answer was clearly very strong government policy mm. in favor of basic education. So I would like to agree that this is something we need to do better in India. But we did do one thing right, which very few developing countries did, and that was pump a serious amount of resources and attention into higher education. Everything from government subsidies to um, encouraging foreign collaboration. For example, our IITs, the Indian Institutes of Technology, are now spoken of uh, in America, for example, in the same breath and with the same degree of reverence as the MIT. Why? Because the quality of the products of the IITs has been proven time and time again by their success in the demanding international environment, in the companies they've set up in Silicon Valley, in the kinds of challenges that they have been able to, uh, to overcome, technological and entrepreneurial. And people have said, my gosh, the institutions they came from must 